Good afternoon. I hope uh, everybody who's back here in your seat is awake and ready for an hour of uh, discussion on Q1A and Q1D. Uh, it's an honor to be invited here. I want to thank the organizer first for having me here on a topic which is almost as old as the ICH itself uh, because it's the first series of quality guidelines uh, being uh, introduced. And uh, I represented FDA uh, on the ICH Q1 EWG expert working group for um, Q1A revision, Q1D, Q1E, and Q1F, which was subsequently withdrawn. Um, so I would like to share with you not some of the key principles of these two guidelines, but also uh, some thinking behind these guidelines and uh, the experience from the eyes of a regu former regulator and now uh, a representative from the industry. Uh, may I, uh, if you don't mind, have a show of hands. I understand that uh, the attendees today are mostly from the industry, academia, and research institutes. And by a show of hand, how many of you have heard Q1 AR2 and Q1D? And how many have actually practiced one or both guidelines? Anyone? All right, thank you. I guess that makes my job easier. Uh, it's not as many as I thought, but uh, I certainly don't have time to go through all the details, and I hope uh, when I'm done, uh, and I have some questions at the end as in the form of exercise. If you can take part in that, uh, when I get to those uh, case studies, uh, it will be great, and I hope by the end of my presentation and exercises, uh, you will uh, you know, feel that you have learned something new. And naturally, since I'm covering two ICH guidelines, my talk is uh, divided into two parts. The first part is Q1AR2, and the second part, Q1D. Uh, I will have an outline for each part. The Q1AR2, the history, uh, what it covers and what it does not cover, the purpose of stability testing, basic principles, key concepts, and issues, and then I share with you the experience with implementing ICH Q1AR2 and some thinking behind, uh, looking through the glass of someone that's uh, being involved in the expert working group. A brief history about Q1AR2. It was uh, signed off as step four, which means it's final issued by ICH uh, in October 1993. It's the first Q, uh, I, ICH quality guideline being signed off. But within about five years, uh, industry representatives began to voice concerns about certain parts that are either inconsistent within or lacking clarity. So an effort was made and was accepted by the ICH back then called Steering Committee to embark on a revision of the original ICH Q1A. In addition to editorial consistency, uh, certain important uh, guidelines was introduced. Uh, number one, the testing frequencies at accelerated conditions and intermediate conditions. And number two, the adding the storage conditions for products intended for refrigerator or freezer storage. And number three, adding the storage condition for products uh, 
in the semi-permeable containers. And uh, last but not least on this list is adding the so-called stability commitment. And you will see in uh, some slides later uh, why that is important. Then in about, uh, let's see, three, two years after it was signed up as step four, uh, another minor revision was, um, was made. And this time it was to make it consistent with yet a new guideline. And I mentioned that earlier, that's called Q1F. Uh, Q1F was to cover zone three and four because the original ICH regulatory members, uh, namely US, EU, and Japan, uh, fall under the so-called climatic zone two. And therefore, the conditions established in the Q Q1A was only applicable to those countries. And other countries, uh, South Korea is one of them, uh, that fall under zone two. And Q1F was established to expand uh, on the storage conditions for countries that fall under zone three and zone four. Uh, it was subsequently withdrawn, and I will explain briefly later why it was withdrawn. So in the second revision in 2003, it was merely a recognition of the long-term condition in Q1F for zone four, which is 30 degrees, 65 percent relative humidity. And uh, there was a change to the long-term storage conditions to recognize this 3065. I will uh, refer to this condition in brief, abbreviated form, 3065. Uh, otherwise, it's the long term for zone four is recognized uh, to be an alternative to uh, 3060 for intermediate condition. And in addition, the um, uh, intermediate can be a long term condition. So more of these will become uh, apparent later in my presentation. All right. So. Um, Q1F was later withdrawn, and nevertheless, these uh, options remain. So we are now calling it Q1AR2 after two revisions. The objective of this guideline is to define the stability data packa package for new drug substance and product, and mainly here we are talking about uh, chemical drugs, that would be considered sufficient for a uh, new product registration in the ICH countries. And uh, second objective, to exemplify the core data package uh, while leaving sufficient uh, flexibility for drug developers. And third, alternative approaches uh, are recognized to be acceptable as long as they are scientifically justified. Uh, as far as the scope, I mentioned that it uh, is intended to cover chemical drugs, new chemical entities, and their associated dosage forms and products. Uh, but it also applies to line extension, which is typically uh, referred to in the industry, uh, or new dosage form of an uh, already approved uh, chemical entity. And it also applies to biotech products. Uh, and it's uh, done by cross-referencing. And these guidelines are recognized, um, uh, they recognize each other in their own guidelines by cross-referencing. Uh, this slide lists what is or are not covered in Q1AR2. It does not cover information to be submitted for abbreviated or abridged or oftentimes called generic drug applications. Although the essence of it, uh, the storage conditions, amount of data uh, have uh, over time been adopted by reg various regulators to apply to generic drug applications. 
It also, uh, the Q1 AR2 does not, and it says clearly, does not apply to post-approval variations. And it does not apply to clinical trial applications. It also doesn't discuss the following, how to conduct a shipping simulation study, how to conduct thermocycling studies of refrigerated products or semi-solids, and doesn't discuss at all about stress testing for drug products, except to define it. Um, and it does not provide specific test attributes to be uh, included in the protocol for stability studies, uh, except to cross-reference ICHQ6A, Q6B, and ICHQ3A, Q3B. Uh, It does not, and I underscore it does uh, the not, it does not require the stability data to be from the commercial site. And more to come in subsequent slides. It leaves the uh, specific storage statement in the labeling to national authorities. So what, why should we conduct stability testing for pharmaceuticals? when it comes to registration. Uh, this st study is conducted to provide evidence on how the quality of the drug product or drug substance varies with time under a variety of conditions, uh, including temperature, humidity, and light. And uh, secondly, to establish a retest period for the drug substance, uh, shelf life for the drug product, along with the appropriate storage conditions. It also uh, is intended to evaluate the effect of short-term exclusions through accelerated stability study. And this will, uh, uh, the short-term excursion outside of the label storage condition could occur during shipping. So any uh, such situation that may happen uh, the knowledge can only be gleaned from accelerated study and uh, storage condition, uh, label storage condition may have to appropriately reflect any caution that needs to be taken. Testing frequency, this is uh, probably the most basic within the guideline, but again this uh, addresses the chemical drugs now everything here applies to biotech products. For long-term testing at room temperature, for products intended for room temperature storage, for the first year it's every three months, and for the second year every six months. Then after, thereafter it's yearly testing. For accelerated study, it's typically a six-month study and should contain at least three time points, including the initial and six months time point. If the, the, there's a trend that's uh, out of, that is not ex expected or going to be worse than expected, then the recommendation in um, Q1 AR2, as far as accelerated time points, is to add additional testing at the last time point, six months, or, or adding a fourth time point in addition to the original three time points. And this way you'll get a more precise, uh, more accurate picture of how the uh, product behave uh, accelerated. And then there's the intermediate condition, which would need to kick in if uh, there are significant changes at accelerated condition after six months. And the intermediate condition is um, 30 degrees and initially 65% RH, and it can be 75% RH as well. Now, uh, there, the number of time points is at least four, including initial and 12 months. It's a 12-month study as far as intermediate. Here's a... Uh, table showing the general case, meaning products intended for room temperature storage. 
and uh, long-term intermediate accelerated in that order. Uh, storage conditions here, uh, it's intended for zone one and two. Uh, and the minimum amount of data at the time of submission on the last column. Uh, for long-term study, it's either 2560 or 3065, as explained as a result of Q1F. And intermediate is 3065, again, to be aligned with the long-term for zone four. At a time of submission, six months from a 12-month study. Accelerated, as explained earlier. So to reiterate, the uh, long term, uh, these are footnotes to the table in the previous slide. The, um, for the long term study, it's up to the applicant to choose between 25, 60, and 30, 65, which is otherwise the long term for zone 4A. And uh, if 3065 is used as the long-term condition, there is no intermediate condition. But if there is intermediate condition, it's triggered and necessitated when significant change occurs at the accelerated condition, uh, any time between zero and six months. The, um, Uh, although Q1F was, was uh, withdrawn, uh, WHO had revised their stability guideline to introduce, uh, to split zone four into zone 4A and zone 4B. Zone 4A long-term condition is 3065, while for zone 4B is 3075, 30 degrees 75. 5% RH. And would you believe that in recent years, many multinational companies that market their products all over the world start to shift to utilizing only 3075, 30 degrees 75% RH as their long term condition, unless their product cannot withstand that kind of stressful condition quote unquote. So uh, it's interesting if, you know, nowadays you use the most stressful long-term condition for the purpose of marketing, utilizing as few uh, storage chambers or station as possible while marketing to uh, all countries in all regions and all climatic zones. Accelerated testing mentioned earlier I uh, just want to go through a little bit more details. Uh, it's a study that's designed to increase the rate of chemical degradation and physical changes uh, under more exa exaggerated storage condition as part of a, uh, uh, underscore this, formal stability study. So in addition to long-term accelerate, it's part of the formal study. Data from these studies uh, in addition to the long term, can be used to assess or predict longer term chemical uh, changes and can also help evaluate the effect of short term excursion uh, outside of the label storage, uh, such as may occur during shipping. However, uh, what should be noted is results from accelerate, accelerate testing may not always be predictive of physical changes. Significant change. Um, this is a very useful concept introduced in Q1. For a drug substance, significant change just means that failure to meet the specification. For a drug product, it's more complicated. Uh, in terms of assay, it's a 5% change from its initial value, which will be considered to be significant change. If you're talking about uh, assay 
uh, or potency using biological or immunological procedures, then it's simply failure to meet the acceptance criteria. Likewise, many other attributes, chemical as well as physical, are simply failure to meet the acceptance criteria. Noting, however, for an original uh, registration, the applicant is proposing to set not only shelf life, but specification. So we have two variables that are, uh, that they are depend on each other, uh, and yet both are only uh, subject to review and approval. So you can propose, uh, while well, keeping in mind that your proposed uh, shelf life may not be uh, appropriate, based on the review by the regulator, or your acceptance criteria may need to be adjusted. So um, other attributes include uh, degradation products, appearance, physical attributes, functionality tests. Uh, depending on the dosage form, you may have pH, you may have dissolution, and all these have the acceptance criteria, but when it comes to judging significant change for dissolution, 12 units is uh, required. And another important, uh, by the way, there are some slides that may be rearranged. You may notice that between uh, 13 and 14, 15, 16, I've rearranged these four slides. Uh, an important concept is between formal study and supporting data. Formal stability studies are uh, long-term and accelerated using the uh, primary batches, or it can be commercial batches. Com I'm sorry, it either primary or commitment batches, which I'll explain later. According to the prescribed protocol, to establish, in the case of primary batch, a uh, retest period or shelf life. In the case of commitment batch, it would be to uh, confirm the retest period or shelf life. And in contrast, supporting data, uh, other than the formal stability, uh, data from the formal stability batches. And these are data that are obtained uh, from earlier formulation, earlier synthetic route, uh, di different formulation, clinical batch formulation that uh, have been altered for the purpose of commercialization, uh, and so on and so forth. But they can be used to support the setting of the retest period or shelf life. Here, uh, I'm contrasting primary batches with production batches. Primary batch is a batch of the drug substance or product used in the primary stability study. Uh, they, are, uh, they are used to uh, support the setting of the shelf life and uh, retest period. And for drug substance, what is a primary batch? It has to be at least a pilot scale batch. For drug product, uh, especially in terms of, well first, the definition is two of the three batches should be at least pilot scale. And the third one can be smaller than a pilot scale, meaning it can even be a lab scale batch. As long as all these batches are made by the same synthetic route, the same formulation as intended for commercialization, uh, the same using the same type of equipment and process, and be tested to the same specification. The same does not mean identical. So it just means representative similar. So these are words used in Q1AR2. Uh, 
what is uh, pilot scale as far as dosage form? For a solid dosage form, uh, it is typically uh, considered that uh, 1,000, uh, 100, thousand tablets or units uh, or one-tenth of the full production scale is considered a pilot. Uh, now that's primary batch, meaning it doesn't have to be production batch. It says clearly it can be pilot. Uh, and production batch, on the other hand, is a batch manufactured at production scale by using the production equipment in a fac production facility as indicated in the application. So meaning commercial, commercial site, commercial uh, equipment, etc. However, uh, Q1A makes it clear that for the purpose of establishing shelf life as part of the registration, the stability batches do not have to come from the commercial site. It can be, but it's uh, not required. Here's a uh, concept that is very critical, very useful when the Q1A went through the revision. Um, there were talks about site-specific, meaning commercial site-specific stability data, but it was uh, eventually agreed that stability using batches that are representative of the commercial product or site are totally acceptable and the protection against any uh, over liberal setting of this, the shelf life uh, can be protected by so-called commitment. So the company would make a commitment to conduct uh, additional stability study and I'll explain, uh, define them on this slide as a way of verifying the, uh, or confirming the proposed uh, retest period or shelf life. On this slide and the next slide for drug product, uh, both are talking about commitment. Uh, what that means is when the available long-term stability data on primary batches do not cover the entire length of the retest period, granted at the time of the approval, then a commitment should be made by the applicant to continue the studies until the uh, approved show, uh, retest period can be, com uh, can be confirmed. And um, also, if the batches used are less than production batches, then you need to make a commitment. So, if the submission includes long-term stability data from three production batches and the stability data have already covered the proposed shelf life or retest period, then that's the responsibility on the part of the applicant as far as stability is complete. However, if there's anything short, then a commitment needs to be made. Uh, in other words, if you do have three production batches, but you do not cover the entire uh, retest period, then you need to commit to continuing the ongoing studies until uh, the proposed or approved retest period have been reached. If there are fewer than three production batches, then the commitment will be to place placing additional batch or batches to a total of three production batches on long term uh, through the approved retest period. And the third scenario is there is no production batch in the submission. Then the commitment is to place the first three production batches on long term through the approved retest period.
This slide also talks about commitment, but it's about drug product. Everything is parallel to the drug substance stability commitment, with the only exception uh, accelerated. So for each of these three scenarios, in addition to long-term, covering the approved shelf life, these uh, uh, accelerated should be finished to six months, and additional batches should also be carried out uh, accelerated conditions, which you don't find in drug substance. Uh, now I'd like to share with you some experience in uh, implementing Q1AR2. Overall, I would say that it's been successful um, because it has uh, achieved in its intended purpose as laid out in the original uh, guideline as well as in the revision uh, in the ICH uh, funding member countries. And other countries, perhaps among others, maybe in, in, aside from the CTD, uh, Q1 series is among the first ones being adopted by many other countries, uh, even before some of them become a member, currently become a member. Uh, Q1 was of great interest to many country, many uh, regulatory agencies. Uh, in addition to implementing as uh, intended, you, we have seen that less than the ICH recommended primary stability package has been submitted and accepted by regulatory agencies in certain situations. And those situations include applications for breakthrough therapies, rare diseases, uh, or in some countries there, the so-called accelerated review and approval process to meet uh, unmet medical needs. And that's understandable. Um, anything the industry and government can work together to bring uh, much needed medicine to the patients is to be um, applauded. However, there's a catch. Um, the industry understands that the ultimately approved shelf life or retest period may be shorter than normal uh, due to the amount of data may be limited and the supporting data may be also limited. <coughs> and other alternative approaches such as reduced uh, stability protocol for commitment batches, science risk-based predictive tools have been proposed, submitted, and their acceptance by regulatory agencies uh, are sort of case by case. It's, uh, it's the result is kind of mixed. I have a case study to illustrate reduced protocol for commitment badges. Uh, these two products, sorry, this is a slide that I added. I don't know if you will have access to this electronically. Uh, it, you won't find it in the slide deck. Apology for that. So these are two uh, simple examples, and they are very similar, actually. Uh, product A is a tablet. It's a... Uh, Long term, uh, on the primary stability batches, the protocol includes testing of appearance, assay degradants, dissolution, and water content at 3, 6, 9, 12, 24, 36, 48, 60 months, plus a six attribute microbial enumeration uh, tested only yearly. So that's for the primary batches. For commitment batches, Pfizer proposed to uh, omit three months, six months, nine months in the first year, and also remove microbial enumeration altogether. 
the, the regulatory acceptance varies, and it's been approved in the U.S. except for the omission of three, six, and nine months in the first year. EU accepted the propose, proposed reduced protocol. So did China, Switzerland, Canada. Uh, and the proposed reduced protocol is currently under review in several other countries. Product B, uh, also a tablet. For the primary stability protocol, uh, I think the same five tests as product A are tested at 369, 12, 18, 24, 36, plus microbial enumeration yearly. Then for commitment batches, Pfizer proposed to uh, drop water content and, it's the, and reduce the time point to 6, 12, 24, 36. So in addition to water content, microbial enumeration also is removed. Now this proposed reduced protocol for commitment batches has been approved in the US, EU, Canada, and UAE. A further reduced protocol where the assay was also removed had been approved in Turkey and Taiwan. And this proposal is under review along with their applications uh, in other countries. There are country-specific stability requirements which uh, present a challenge to companies who market their products globally. Uh, that is divergence from Q1 AR2, leading to disharmony. Uh, examples. Some regulators expect stability data from commercial drug product side and even commercial drug substance side. This is what I referred to earlier as commercial site specific stability data. And um, Singapore, Malaysia are among those countries. Apparently it's required according to ASEAN stability guidelines although only Singapore and Malaysia have actually enforced it. Some countries have their own unique requirements, in-country testing, routine in-use studies, and uh, Brazil and Visa is one of those regulatory agencies requiring these. And raw data chromatograms, South Korea and China, are among those countries. Some regulators apply Q1 AR2 to post-approval variations. Remember, Q1 AR2 is not to apply, be applied to variations. And what's even more challenging is not only they're applied, uh, we find ourselves facing regulators who will want the three batches, the whole full shelf life, uh, of stability data for a major post-approval variation and would uh, require the shelf life to be established uh, anew, or, uh, like a new product, uh, without allowing the uh, approved shelf life prior to the change to be retained. And some regulators, and I would say that uh, examples of the first and the second, these two, uh, China comes to mind. And then um, Brazil would require repeated photo stability and forced degradation study uh, for post approval variation. So you can see that this. Uh, poses uh, tremendous challenges to uh, multinational companies. A case study uh, on, a site on the site-specific stability requirement. This is a Pfizer product. It's called Product X. And in the US, it received um, 
uh, breakthrough therapy designation. Uh, but it wasn't for that exact reason that FDA accepted 12, 12 months of uh, drug product stability along with drug substance, uh, which is now produced at the commercial site. It's at the R&D. This would normally be accepted in uh, FDA and EU as well. Uh, in other words, in the submission, there is no uh, drug product made at the commercial site with drug substance made at the intended commercial site. There was no, no data. Uh, it's submitted in December 2017. Uh, a month later, the same package plus available uh, long term was updated to 12 months, was submitted to EU. Uh, just like in the US, no additional stability data with more com uh, with uh, commercial drug substance included in the drug product was available and was not submitted, of course. Both uh, agencies approved 24 months uh, shelf life and retest period. In Singapore, uh, it's not just for the stability, but stability was one of the reasons for a uh, one month delay, I mean one year delay in submitting stability data because of this uh, site specific uh, stability data. And, uh, and in addition, there was more data from uh, the, the R&D site as far as drug substance and the drug product made from the R&D site of drug substance. Uh, what the Singapore required was site-specific drug substance used in the drug product for registration. And they, although required 12 months, they allow Pfizer to file while waiting for the 12 months to be available. Uh, Malaysia actually did not accept the nine months data and they uh, wanted to wait, wanted uh, Pfizer to wait until the 12 months became available. So there was a six months delay. So you can see that the uh, commercial site specific stability data uh, could be uh, a delay, could cause significant delay to simultaneous submission and review and approval. This is a, a depiction of, and maybe not fair, but it gives you an idea that just based on the number of stability queries or questions, information requests received from the regulatory agencies, um, seven products I've listed here over the submitted globally over the last eight years across, uh, again, I select some countries, across nine countries for comparison. And at a glance, you can tell that for a given product, you go across, like new molecular entity one, US uh, send us 15 queries, one from EU, and so on and so forth. The range of the number of queries on a given product vary. And the reverse seems to be true between US and EU on the second product, so on and so forth. So you can see that it vary the number very widely. And it is an indirect indication that the uh, Im implementation of Q1AR2 is sort of a divert. It's a, there's a divergence in implementing Q1AR2. The next slide is just a 3D plot of what you saw in the table. Uh, South Korea is represented in yellow. And, and across the different products, you can see in some cases there are a lot of questions. In some other cases, very few questions. You can go across that way as I uh, showed you in the table. And again, this is just a snapshot of what uh, could be perceived as uh, divergence in implementing Q1 AR2 on the basis 
of the number of queries received. I think we have some time. I'd like to go through some questions. If you can give me a short answer by raising your hand, I will appreciate. Uh, we'll see. Otherwise, I'll just give you the answer uh, very quickly. Stress testing, remember, uh, we didn't go into detail, but I did mention that only stress testing on drug substance was described and the purpose and everything. Uh, but there's nothing mentioned uh, on drug product. Do you know why? Anyone wants to guess? If you, uh, uh, you can be a, a fly on the wall in the ICH expert working group meeting, you will see that not every topic under the sun can be agreed upon or can be even uh, agreed to be discussed. And there are just too many topics to be uh, included in one guideline. So every members, every country have to weigh the importance, the impact, and the feasibility of reaching an agreement. And this is the one area, stress testing for drug product, was probably deemed, this was before my time actually, uh, too, too diverse, too many dosage forms to cover. Selection of batches, uh, it has been set three batches, at least three batches, primary or commitment, whatever, what have you. Anybody knows why three or at least three? Any brave so would like to give me a guess? All right. Uh, if you talk to a statistician, they will tell you, you have to have at least three. And that's sort of a minimum requirement. One can tell you uh, anything, because it's just one sample. Two, you don't know if uh, one happens to be too low and the other two happens to be, be too high. So three is sort of the minimum, uh, so you can do some uh, uh, trending, you can do some comparison, and uh, maybe even conduct statistical analysis and maybe even pulling them together. Uh, pilot scale is acceptable. Why did uh, the ICH not require production batches? I guess they could, probably could have. I could venture to guess, and this again was in the original Q1A, it was before my time uh, when the revision began. I could only guess that regulators may well have wished uh, production batches be used. But industry will argue otherwise because during a clinical trial, during drug development, things are changing, the, especially in the uh, drug synthesis or a formulation or process. Things are changing for the better things are uh, for a, a better uh, or more improved process or better quality. And however, if a pilot scale batch can be representative of the to be marketed, then the stability uh, should not change when you go to a larger scale. So it's a uh, sort of a compromise between what's practical and what's scientifically justified. Test frequency. We talked about at least three time points for accelerated. And uh, what's so significant of about three? Does that sound familiar? We mentioned the three batches. Again, if you only have two points, you can easily draw a straight line, right? So you need at least three to see any kind of variability or uh, trending. And again, the three appears here. For long-term st stability study, in the first year, the recommendation is every three months. So three 
uh, time points between zero and 12. Why, three, why more frequent in the first year, and then less frequent the second year, and then after that, it's yearly? Anybody wants to guess? Why do we need fre more frequent testing the first year? Actually, this is uh, contrary to what a statistician will tell you. If you can uh, space out your test, your samples, you'll get a more precise estimate of shelf life. But we do not have the luxury of waiting for 36 months, 48 or 60 months. Uh, so the purpose of having more frequent testing in the first year is really to give you a quick idea, a, a faster glance at how this product behaves. So more frequent testing uh, early, as opposed to spacing them out when you don't really have the luxury of time to wait for the three year, four year, or five year time point. Two more slides on these questions. Uh, again, this is just to help you understand the thinking behind the, uh, the guideline. Intermediates, um, if it's a significant change, at accelerated, you do the intermediate. And why six months from a 12-month study? Why intermediate and why six months from 12 months? I don't know uh, those here that have either overseen a stability study have had to do the intermediate. Again, this intermediate is needed uh, only if the accelerated observes uh, a significant change. And the reason that a 30 degree data is needed is to protect the higher end of room temperature fluctuation. Even in country uh, like South Korea, you may have hot days that will exceed 30 degrees with high humidity in the summer months. So. 30 degrees become necessary if the accelerator uh, has significant change. On the other hand, if uh, 30 degrees is chosen to be the long term, there is no intermediate to speak of. Uh, I would like to point to this question here. Now, significant change ex accelerated triggers intermediate, but what happens if significant change occurs also as intermediate, which in this case is 30 degrees. What, what can you do? What can you do with your product or your data? Well, if you have significant change at 30 degrees, the intermediate condition, there, uh, it brings into question whether your product is um, stable enough to withstand the upper end of uh, room temperature fluctuation. And you have two or three courses of, of, uh, of options to consider. Uh, one is to uh, widen your uh, acceptance criteria in your specification, if that applies. And obviously, you need to have the proper justification to widen it. Uh, this will allow the significant change to not occur, all right, if the spec is wider. Um, the other option is to add a cautionary statement in the label storage condition to av avoid exposure to 30 degrees, etc. It's not the best protection, however. Uh, then in the extreme case, perhaps you need to change to a more protective container closure system. And maybe as the last resort, maybe you even have to reformulate. So all these are uh, potential uh, possible uh, remedies, but hopefully the uh, product is develop in such a way that it can withstand the intermediate. 
limited extrapolation beyond shelf life, uh, beyond available data, uh, can be granted. What does it mean by uh, limited? Anyone? I think in Q1 A R2, it doesn't say what that limited is. It does uh, provide explanation in Q1 E. Uh, and it's uh, <coughs> uh, defined as um, equal, equal to the amount of data available. And remember, at the time of submission, it should be at least 12 months long term. So extrapolation, if uh, justified, can be up to 12 months. Okay, and that's just a short answer to this question. I have a couple more. Uh, I explain why stability, com stability commitment is necessary and under what situations it is necessary earlier. Um, and I explain why site-specific stability data is not required. And this is an interesting question to you. Q1E, uh, although it's not in the scope of my presentation, I'd like to mention it. Are you aware the Q1C is only half a page long? That may well be, and I can't verify that uh, now. It's probably the shortest ICH guideline ever. And the reason is that it was initially intended to cover post-approval changes, major post-approval changes, in addition to new dosage form. And this is a one good example where the members on the expert working group and from different countries could not agree on which major post-approval changes uh, should be included and what are they and how much stability data should be required for those changes. Because the parties cannot agree, they just decide to take them all out, leaving only the new dosage form. And that's why there's only half a page. Uh, I talked about Q1F was withdrawn and why? Because WHO came out with uh, Q, I mean, uh, 4A and 4B. Okay. If, is it acceptable for a company to choose to use the most uh, stressful long-term condition required by uh, 4B, uh, zone 4B, or even slightly less stressful, zone 4A, instead of zone 2, which is the least stressful? Is that acceptable? I think I gave, my ans gave the answer away. Yes, it is acceptable because it's more stressful. All right, so that's the end of my Q1A presentation. How much time do I have left?
I'll go faster with the second half. Q and D. And I was told that the, this audience will be interested in the uh, application of Q and D, namely bracketing and matrixing. Um, I skip the history. All right, uh, about the objective. This guideline is to describe two types of reduced stability protocol and provide the situation where the bracketing or matrixing can be applied uh, straightforwardly or can be applied with additional justification or cannot be applied at all. And um, the guideline also provides examples uh, both for bracketing and matrixing. And also uh, warns the uh, user uh, about potential risks about these uh, designs. Briefly, uh, bracketing is a uh, design of a protocol where only samples on extremes of certain design factors, meaning strength, container size, and or field size, are tested at all time points as in a full design. And uh, there's an assumption that's made for uh, bracketing design. It assumes that the intermediates, uh, the stability of the intermediate levels that are not tested is represented by the stability on the extreme. I'm not gonna go over this applicability and it should be in your slide in the interest of time. Let's focus on this uh, example given in Q1D. This is a example where three strengths, 50 milligrams, 75, 100 milligrams are uh, being tested and three container sizes, 15, 100, and 500. <clears throat> in a break, this breaking design, the middle strengths is totally uh, omitted. It will not be placed on stability and will not be tested. Similarly, the middle container size will not be tested, will not be put on stability. So there are three, six, nine, twelve. Twelve sets of samples or twelve runs that are put on stability in comparison to Full design. A full, a full design will be will have all these boxes checked. Meaning, uh, let's see, three by nine, twenty-seven runs. Twenty-five, uh, twenty-nine, seven sets of samples to be put on stability. But now you are only through the bracketing design. You are only doing. Uh, 12, 12 out of 27 possible combinations. So that's a substantial savings. But it also comes with the risk. What if um, <clears throat> the 100 milligram, well, the 50 turns out to be less stable than 100 and predicts a shorter shelf life than the 100. What about the 75 that's not even tested? it will be considered no more stable than the 50. So you will set the shelf life to be the same as what's predicted for the 50, okay? And if there is no sample put on storage chamber, even though not tested, you cannot go back. There's nothing there to be tested uh, when things start to go south or go wrong. Matrixing. Uh, this is a totally different concept than bracketing. It's a uh, protocol where the, a selected subset of all combination, all possible combinations, is tested at a given time point. At a subsequent time point, a different subset of all combination will be tested. And the assumption here is that 
the stability of each subset of all combinations is a representative of the stability of all combinations at a given time point. Again, I won't have time to talk about the design factors, and I just would like to point out on this slide, balance. The design should be balanced in such a way that each combination of factors is tested, tested to the same extent over the intended duration of the study. Uh, it's easier to explain that in this example. There are two strengths in this example. And uh, for there are three batches for each strength. The normal 0, 3, 6, 9, et cetera, et cetera. And in the, uh, the design, in, in the matrixing design, here we're skipping six and uh, 18 months. And similarly, we're skipping uh, nine months here and 24 months here. So ideally, to balance, you do sort of a pattern. And if you skip two time points, over the entire course of the study, then you do the same for the next combination of batch and strength. Uh, and should have been same here. So between the zero and end, you have four stations tested instead of six. You do the same with the other combinations, except for these two you, that look out of place. So for perfect, perfectly balanced design, matrixing design, it would have been, these would be taken out. That would be considered balanced, so because each, the combination is tested to the same extent at a given time point. But they are added because we wouldn't have uh, 24, 36 months data. We may only have 12, the last time point available before submission, so the, re the regulatory constraint placed on this is that all combination will be tested before, at the last time point before submission, all right? So that is sort of throw the balance off a little bit, uh, but it is a regulatory constraint to, um, to have at least all the combination tested at the time of submission. The experience with Q1D, um, bracketing is generally well accepted and well practiced. Matrixing is not as widely used. And because lack of experience, either on the part of the applicant or on the part of the regulator, uh, there's insufficient knowledge about the product. And therefore, it's uh, risky to apply matrixing and maybe the, the drug development timeline is compressed uh, and there's not enough time to gather uh, more supporting data or more knowledge. Okay, let me uh, share with you a case study that's uh, a Pfizer product and it's recently submitted to various countries, and it um, utilizes both bracketing and matrixing. Uh, it's a product with three strengths, 15, 30, 45. It's uh, in bottle as well as in blister. Its uh, stability is fairly well, un well understood the main product and uh, attributes to be followed really are just degradants and water content. So the bracketing part is to have one batch only for the middle strength and three batches each for the lower and upper strengths. And for the bottle configuration, there are different counts. Same size bottle, but different counts uh, of fill size. 
And the middle one is not put on stability at all. There's also a second configuration of packaging, foil for your blister. Okay, so you can see how the middle strength is reduced in the number of batches. The middle size bottle is not tested at all. And then on top of that, uh, we did matrixing. So you still have the middle strands. You still have the middle strands here for the largest count. And you don't see the middle bottle size or count size. Uh, the matrixing is applied to each strength, you know, and their skipping of time points. And the 30 basically is a complete testing at all time points. 45 is complementary to the 15, and so on. All right, so these are matrixing on the bottle size and batch and strength. And then a separate matrixing is applied to the foil foil blister. And this has uh, largely been accepted in the countries that uh, it's been filed. Uh, so in the interest of time, I won't ask you the question, but it's been accepted by some countries. And countries that will not accept, and we don't know if there is any yet that I know of, uh, may have a reason not to accept. Uh, so that's... Uh, up to Pfizer to convince the regulator that it's uh, scientifically justified. Another product, uh, this is actually an interesting one. It's a short one that I'd like to share with you. It's really not as part of the original submission, but shortly after approval, uh, the uh, Pfizer, in this case, wants to introduce 0.5 and 0.75, which is bracketed by the original, the approved, 0.25 and 1, uh, and same formulation, uh, but the drug, the load is different. And the proposal is to rely on stability data on the 20, 0.25, 0.25 and 1, and with commitment only for the middle ones. All right? And this is the formulation. Uh, the total weight is the same across the four strengths. The deloins uh, constitute the bulk of the formulation. The drug substance is uh, proportional across the strengths. So it's 99 or 98 to 95. 9% are deliverance, all right? So uh, Pfizer has not submitted this one yet. And our guess is FDA may accept this. Uh, our justification is it's stable at this strength and this strength. We have 24 months data and they're similar. Uh, so the middle one are well represented by the two extremes. The drug load, uh, although incrementally greater, the proportion is uh, roughly the same, okay? All right, so at this point, I think I can close my talk since my, I'm probably going over my allotted time. Thank you all for your attention. Uh, we may not have time right now for question and answer, maybe later. Yes? Okay. Thank you all for your attention.